We're going to continue talking about time frequency and uh, for signal processing and thinking about signals in the time frequency uh, domain and how to manipulate signals in phase in order to create outputs that we might find advantageous in signal processing systems. So part of what we're going after here is to start to analyze filters and their properties and to start to understand the interplay of a filter, of a phase response, and the output that can be achieved, and especially what are the effects of filters that seem ideal, but in practice, in fact, are not ideal uh, due to different effects that we're going to see here that arise uh, even when you have, you know, on paper, it looks like the right kind of filter, but it has actually uh, downstream effects that you would like to manipulate and engineer away. So the kind of ideal filter we typically think about are things like these kind of filters, low pass filters, which uh, seem ideal. They're notch filters that pull out just uh, the low frequency component. So for instance, in the continuous case, here it is, H I W H I omega is one for some frequency less than omega C and zero elsewhere. So there's only one band of frequency gets through, which is near the zero frequency. So that's your low pass filter that you're looking at. And if you look at this in the discrete time filters, then here it is, H, e, H the, e the I omega. It's one again for some frequency below a critical value and zero all the way between pi and negative pi. Remember that for the discrete case, the Fourier domain repeats itself every two pi intervals, right? So whereas the continuous case is infinite in frequencies, the discrete case lives on a domain negative pi to pi. So these two filters are equivalent in a sense for the continuous and discrete case, and here is a pictures of what they look like. So this is the continuous case, this is the discrete case. Um, again, these are ideal filters in the sense that what you would think about doing is I can pull out all the frequencies in this band here perfectly in some sense, except for the fact that what we're going to see here is that when you apply this kind of notch filter like this and this sharp cutoff at the edges is actually going to produce an effect that we're not going to find very advantageous because if we look at what happens to a signal that gets chopped like this, with its square edges, it actually produces oscillations and ringing that are very long lived in the time domain, which is something that is very, highly undesirable for signal processing. So in fact, you can actually just run those filters through, do the inverse Fourier transform of those kind of filters. And this is what we've already seen before. You get these sync functions, which is sine T over T type behavior for the continuous case and sine n over n behavior for the discrete case. So these signals have these shapes here. And this is the problem with what happens. This is really the issue here. So let's look at what happens in time. Let's look at this picture here. So in time, you can see that if I do this notch filter, I get this long lived oscillation. In fact, this oscillation dies off like one over t. So if I do this filtering, I'm going to get a signal that lives for a very long time on either side of this and decays very slowly like 1 over t. The discrete case is similar. And what ends up happening, this is actually terrible signal processing because, in fact, if I take a signal in there, I don't want it to live for all this time. I want it to be a nice compact signal um, in the time domain when I have this nice compact filter in the frequency domain. So square, square filters are actually... Uh, quite undesirable because of this effect, this ringing effect of the signal in time. And so what we want to do is think about designing filters where I can have a nice compact representation, representation in time and the signal doesn't ring for very long times both uh, in, in front and back of this in time. Okay, so most of uh, frequency filter design uh, technologies are trying to come up with architectures to get very nice both properties in frequency and in time jointly. And you can see that this kind of filter here, this notch filter has almost ideal properties and frequencies in the sense that it's really chops up all frequencies. Anything beyond these windows are gone, but it comes at the cost of doing a poor job in the time domain of spreading out your signal broadly in time. And so what we'd like to do is have something compact in frequency and compact in time.
okay? So we're gonna think about the design of filters because that's actually most of signal processing is revolves around filters and filter design. And there's some very sophisticated filters that have been built and engineered largely to overcome this issue here, these kind of issues that you see in signal processing. So by the way, the filter itself, uh, you know, this is just a multiplication by the absolute value when we think about a filter like this. But in the last lecture, what we also showed is you don't just get this filter, you could also manipulate the phase within that filter. So for instance, if you had this filter and you also then put a phase ramp on your signal in that filter bandwidth, what we know is a linear phase shifts the signal in time. So look at the combined action of these two things. You have a filter pulling out only a band of frequencies, but within that band, you add a linear phase ramp. So what's gonna happen is, this is gonna create that sync-like behavior, but this phase ramp is gonna shift this thing in time. And depending upon the slope of this, it determines how much the signal gets shifted. So. Here it is. This is the response of this. So you get the sync function, but notice it's shifted over by alpha, where alpha was the slope of that phase ramp that you added to the signal. So you can start to see the possibilities available to you. In the last lecture, we talked about the fact that within a band of frequencies, you can manipulate the phase. A linear phase ramp is just shifting the signal in time. A nonlinear phase actually reshapes the signal itself. In addition to that phase manipulation, here you also have the fact that the signal itself is, sh is shaped by the filter. So, you know, this is a step filter and the step filter produces a sync function in time. So it reshapes signal into this shape as we do that processing. And again, as signal processing, what you're gonna do is you're gonna manipulate both phase and filters to get out some desired response. That is an, that's the entire engineering goal of digital signal processing, really at the end of the day, is run a signal through a device. How do I get a desired output? I've got to engineer what that system is doing in terms of filtering and phasing of the signal in order to achieve an output response that I would like. Okay, so one of the ways to start addressing this is to have evaluations of how the signal comes through. So the first thing to look at is we call the step response, right? So what we do is we say, here's my output Y. It's this impulse response times here, which is the, the step function. So this is like an on switch, right? So I come in, I have something that turns on at time zero, and I ask the question, what's the output? So this is the step response to the system. So here are the responses, both in the time domain and, uh, sorry, in the continuous and the discrete cases. So once we have these signals, we can actually just evaluate them. And these are our convolutional way of evaluating these things. Uh, we could have also done the Fourier transform if we like, but uh, this is equivalent to that. And we wanna start to understand the response to an input signal to the step function, because one of the things we're gonna look at is, when we put in a step function and look at the response, part of what we wanna do is evaluate what this response looks like and what are the problems with the signal on the output. Let me give you an example. What happens with this ringing is reflected here in the, impulse, in the step response for both the continuous and discrete case. So for instance, the signal comes on, you get this ringing, and then and it rings down. So the ringing is something that you would you'd like to remove from your signal processing, or you'd like to make it as small an impact as possible. There's also this finite time of rise, right? So how quickly does this thing get up to where you need it to be? How quickly does it come down to the value of one is what it should be? And so you see this phenomena both in the continuous case and the discrete case, and it starts to set up an evaluation framework for how well does a filter work? Ideally, an ideal filter would be zero, you turn the thing on, and it's one. But of course, you don't actually ever get that. Depending upon your filter and the response function, 
you get things like this and what you'd like to engineer is make this region as short as possible and the ring down as fast as possible. So let's talk about architectures for doing this or at least evaluation metrics for thinking about that ring down, that turn on, and how quickly can I get back to a signal that I like as fast as possible because remember all these electronics are usually going on a very fast time scale so if you have to wait for the system to settle it creates a lot of latency time that you have to uh, that you have to sacrifice uh, waiting for your electronics to get to the state you need it to be in robustly so here's the here's the goal is to start thinking of evalu valuations of non-ideal filters so here's a picture that kind of shows what we're talking about here so what we're looking at here is sort of in some sense in the frequency domain and this is again the absolute value of the frequency you know you have some filter and these are you know this is one filter that potentially could be built there is the bandpass region in other words this is where you're trying to let signals through so that's called the bandpass and of course the bandpass you know well, you'd love it to be a very nice uh, perfect response there right uh, so you'd love this to be one but of course it's between let's say one plus delta one one minus delta one Okay, and so you kind of worry about how big is this band here uh, for, and that really determines how well performing this is. And after the band pass, you have a transition region. This is the region in which it drops down. And so the frequencies in here, you know, they're kind of still getting uh, passed through, uh, but not as much as in the band. So, but you still worry about this region. You'd love this transition region to be as sharp as possible without creating a lot of complications for the output signal. Remember, when we looked at the ideal filter, the transition region in, the, in, in sort of this notch filter was actually perfect. There was no transition region, but the impact of it was in the time domain. It created all this ringing that was the sync function. You also have the stop band. This is where all the fil these are all the frequencies that are, say, below some level that are all being uh, attenuated out of the system. So there's these different ways of characterization, uh, characterizing the response of a filter, a non-ideal filter, which is, you know, there's some delta 2, which measures how big this is here, right? So this is just, you're trying to make this zero, but of course it's never quite zero, but it's contained down to some delta 2. You have this here where you're trying to flatten this filter out, but delta one tells you essentially how much you're not flat. And then you have this transition region here, which is between WP and WS, in which you're kind of transitioning between the band and the stop parts of the filter. So this is, these are the kind of things you're gonna be looking at when you're evaluating filter design, because every filter is typically, it's is non-ideal. There's a mathematical idealization of a filter, but then you build one in practice and you worry about exactly all these characterizations here, like the delta one, the delta two, and the difference between WP and WS. Corresponding to the filter is its step response in the time domain. So remember, this is the frequency domain picture, but we have to come back and see what does this impact us on the time domain. Remember, we're gonna look at the time domain after we've done filtering with this non-ideal filter. And for instance, here's the kind of thing we might see. The filter comes on from the step response and there's this ring down that we've talked about. And typically what happens is again, you define a performance metric. You want this thing to come into a value of one. And of course it overshoots by some delta and you're worried about how much it overshoots. That's like a penalty you could think about on your filter. And also, we say it's one, but it's within some band of one. So there's a little bit of a delta here. We define, in some sense, uh, a region that we're a tolerance that we're willing to accept for this thing to work. And so the time it takes to get within the tolerance, we call that TS, this is really important, right? This is the time it just took for your filter to do what it was supposed to do, right? And if this time is very long, it means your electronics is going to be really slow because you have to wait quite a long time just for this thing to do what it was supposed to do which is get back to a value of one or near one within some tolerance so pictures like this really matter for evaluating filter design because you have to think about what does the filter look like in frequency what does it correspond and look like in time and from those you would start to now engineer uh, 
both the phase response, the shaping of the filter itself in order to achieve the best behavior both in time and frequency. Typically, I've already shown you that the notch filter, which is this ideal on off with very sharp regions, actually gives you a terrible uh, time domain signal, which is the sink, which rings down for a very long time, like it decays like one over T. It, you would never actually do this in practice. It, it would create all kinds of problems right here in this region of making this exceptionally long and making your, all of your electronics or all your signal processing really slow before it even achieved the kind of results you needed to. And so people have designed uh, over decades and decades of work, lots of uh, sophisticated filters that manipulate both the phase and the shape of the intensity, the fil uh, frequency filtering in order to produce some trade-offs between time and frequency. And what you're seeing here are two important filter classes that people have engineered, the elliptic filter and the Butterworth filter. These are really common in, in, in a lot of modern technology, especially the Butterworth filter, where it has some kind of, this is the magnitude of the response, okay? So it has a much slower drop-off than this elliptic filter, which is quite sharp, but the, what you gain by that Butterworth filter and having this slow, a little bit of a slower roll-off is if you look in the time domain, look how quickly that Butterworth filter settles the signal. So your time to get onto your signal is very fast. The elliptic isn't so bad either, but these are the kind of designs that you would be doing in order for you to uh, do sophisticated manipulation of signals and understanding that no matter what filter you build, you're gonna have some penalties and what you'd like to do is just minimize those penalties. And so generically, if you're doing signaling uh, and you're gonna have a filter in there, for instance, you might say, hey, my baseline filter should be a Butterworth filter because the Butterworth filter is actually a very nice trade-off between the behavior and time and frequency in terms of overall performance. And so, and that's reflected here on this chart. And so you wouldn't just do these mathematical idealizations that we've been showing so far in the class. You would go to the literature and, or go to engineering practice where people have thought about this for uh, quite a long time. And these are kind of filters that you would implement in practice. So in some sense where the class is gonna leave us uh, as we get to the end of this first part of a signal processing course is we're gonna get to this point where we've already seen that what we wanna do is really do so much of our work in the frequency domain because we get all these advantages of signal processing by understanding the signal in the frequency domain and we can just multiply the, you know, uh, the input signal it's frequency domain times the impulse response frequency domain and we get out our solutions but then we can also do things like filter both the intensity and phase to manipulate signals the way we wish so the frequency domain is a perfect place to work and then that's where now filter design comes on top of everything we've been talking about to manipulate signals to get an output that you would desire for some kind of engineering application